Hello and welcome to Meet the Newsmakers. I'm John Garlic. I'm here with our Senator Keith Kelly. Keith, how are you? I'm doing great. How about Thanks. you? I'm well. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today. Glad to be here. Now, now you are our state representative down in Montgomery, state senator down in Montgomery, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been you've been that for how long now? Uh, going up three years. Three now. years. Mm -hmm. And you're up for re-election when? Uh, in a uh, year and a half. Year and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. This is a part-time job, right? Well, it's supposed to be that way. <laughs> uh, doesn't work out to be that way, though. We were talking off here, so the, you go back in session. Legislature goes back in session in, in, in February. In February, but mm -hmm. you're going down next week. Right. <clears throat> I'm on the uh, Sunset Committee and Budget Committee. So uh, the Sunset is a committee that you meet throughout the year as well as, as budget preparing for the next year. So I have, uh, I have a pretty full plate. What exactly is Sunset? Sunset is a committee that um, basically holds your different boards and councils accountable. For example, your pharmacy board that issues licenses, um, auctioneer boards, those types of things. They come in and they're audited and then we review the audit with them, uh, see if there's some legislative changes that need to be made. and. Um, and make those changes. Uh, basically, we're an account accountable force that they have to deal with as far as the committee goes. Um, but all the state uh, agencies and licensing boards just about come before us with that. Did I, <clears throat> uh, of course, a licensed counselor, we have the counseling board that we go through, and I thought I heard somewhere that we were consolidating some of these boards. Is that, is that happening? Well, there was a move to do that. There was a bill sponsored, uh, I co-sponsored it um, year before last to, to do that, consolidate them all. The biggest issue we ran into is a lot of the smaller boards don't have a formal office, so they're in with um, somebody's home or you have some subcontractors that are doing the administration part of the board. So we were seeing repeat problems over and over again. So. Um, we put that bill forward to push to put them under the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. And the real point behind that was accountability uh, to attempt to put them in a place to where it was a central location for everyone to be located. Um, there were some problems with that, so we backed off of that a little bit, but we are refocusing on that pretty hard. You'll see some of those that will slowly become accountable to different places. Some might be the Revenue Department or Treasury. And well, so some of the smaller like, ones were doing that. Seems with. like a, it's a way to save some money in overhead maybe, is that? <clears throat> it is, and then you know one of the issues we saw was that the reporting of some of the same mistakes being made over and over and over. And so uh, some of these administrative contracts that they were entering into that should have made sure they met all those obligations, it just wasn't happening. And so, uh, I'm a believer in accountability, and uh, so uh, we're holding them accountable. So they're having to restructure. Uh, last year, we sunsetted the uh, massage therapy board, uh, which was the first time in about 20 years, a, to my knowledge, that uh, a board had been sunsetted, which means they go away. Um, but what we did was we reestablished a new one in its place. Okay. Um, it was just... Uh, really bad as far as not being administered, some of the things that were going on. May be very well possible that uh, we may have another one or two that, that happens to this year. Okay. Well, and you, you got the budget to work on, and when do you, so if you go back in session in February, when do you get the bills that are going to be before you? In February, or you get them ahead of time? Well, you can pre-file a bill. Uh, you actually can pre-file it now. Uh, if you want to have something that, that's ready to go on day one. A lot of times people wait till we actually go into session to do that. Uh, they want to work with others to try to have support for that bill. Mm -hmm. But you can actually introduce bills throughout the session. It's got to go through the House and the Senate, both bodies. Um, and then if you have a problem with one or the other, there's a change in one, and the House and Senate can't reach an agreement, on one, then it goes into what's called a conference committee. And the conference committee uh, is made up of members of the House and Senate. 
they put a final version out in the House or the Senate vote either up or down. And what bills do you think you're going to have going into session? Well, I know that I'm going to have a couple of veterans bills and I will co-sponsor uh, a package of veteran bills that we'll have coming through. I'm on also on the Veterans Committee and Public Safety, so uh, veterans issues are extremely important to me. Uh, coming from a family of veterans and a, a father-in-law that spent his life serving. So, We had a bit of a veterans kerfluffle down in Montgomery a couple of three weeks ago. It is. <laughs> is, that, is that resolved? Uh, depends on how you look at it. <laughs> so um, so uh, the uh, VA administrator and, and the governor supposedly have reached an agreement at the end of the year, however the VA board wants that uh, wants him to stay on so we'll see how that plays out hmm that's an interesting thing yeah <laughs> yeah it, it really is um, and it's a, a fairly complicated thing that people tend to look out the governor appoints the board the VA board mm -hmm. uh, but um, the governor does not appoint the administrator the uh, the board does that so it's a pretty interesting dynamic going on right now that, that is interesting. You would think that would be more straightforward if the board hires the or appoints the director. That it's the board's person, not the governor's. Yeah, the, the controversy seems to be over an ethics complaint about the expenditures of money. And it's my understanding that uh, the administrator was following the board's direction. Uh, so not sure what all the dynamics are in that, but it, it's gotten really complicated. I've heard from our veterans around here that strongly support our administrator. Yeah, I've heard that too. Mm -hmm. Well, so you you have been a businessman, you real mm -hmm. estate, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and you know you were very impactful even before you got elected. Mm -hmm. You were you were instrumental in passing the bill that gave me a job as mental health officer. Yes, uh, sir. Way back in gosh, what year was that? Two thousand seven. Uh, I think uh, so. Yeah. I think yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. And that was so mental health. Mental health issues also on your plate every now and again, aren't they? It is. Uh, mental health is really important. Uh, does it have lobbyists to, lay it, to, to push the, the things that are important in mental health? Um, we had Governor Bentley that was going to um, cut out more mental health facilities uh, in an effort to save budget. Hmm. And um, it wasn't going to save uh, the state budget any money because it was just passing it along to the counties and the cities. And it wasn't uh, in the best interest of those that, uh, that had issues. And mental health is a huge issue in our state and around the country, actually. Yeah. And that's something we've got, we need more of. So uh, I was very fortunate when I was young. I had an uncle that instilled in me that if you want to something to change you just make it happen that you don't necessarily have to count on somebody else to do and so uh, that was one of the uh, the efforts that created the uh, mental health officer mm -hmm. one of my main motives behind that was um, we knew someone very close that uh, had some some mental health issues would get off their meds and then they were hurting themselves or being put in jail whenever they really needed their court hearing to, to find out what needed to be done. And the gap between whenever they were off their meds to the court hearing was uh, a huge problem. So uh, the issue that I found on that was the solution to that was a, a county mental health officer available in every county. Yeah, and that was a good solution. And of course we need more facilities, more beds. Mm -hmm. um, and it is one of those issues that costs everybody. It doesn't mm -hmm. just cost the state budget, it costs the sheriff's office budget, the county's budget, um, your hospitals, all. A lot of money being spent everywhere. You know. That's right. I've told people before that if we could consolidate all that money and put it in one pile, then everybody would go, oh my God, we're, we're wasting a lot of money, let's fix it. But what happens is you're like, yeah, that's, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. yeah, people want to pass the buck on it, but it's really everybody's problem. You know, it goes back to the Bible and Scripture, and you know, get it. Uh, the commandments pretty well tell us that we're supposed to take care of those that can't take care of themselves. And so uh, that's one of the things I think that's very important to me. And a lot of people don't have family out there that have mental health issues. Right. And it's a, a vicious cycle of repetitive 
And uh, so if we don't help them, who's going to help them? That's right. And they end up in jail and emergency rooms and on the street. And it, it can be nasty. Yeah. It can. You know, uh, you, there was a, a, a female situation and she got put into jail and, and had some different issues to come up, was beat up and raped and those types of things. So you, you don't ever know what may happen so they need to be in a place that they're protected from themselves to some degree the the problem is there's just not enough places no we're we're two thousand treatment beds short in the state and really we need about a thousand long-term continuing care beds there's about a thousand people in the state of alabama that cannot function outside a structured environment mm -hmm. and you know we eliminated those starting in the sixties with, with john kennedy's legislation but mm -hmm. um, they end up in a structured environment periodically like jail <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> sometimes they do really well there but that's not the place for them um, but a thousand no. beds would be nice mm -hmm. and it would save a lot of money it just wouldn't save money at the state level it would save money at the county level probably well, I think what uh, a lot of people don't realize is is if if you can get that done throughout the state then it, it's a win for everyone uh, the patient as well as as the communities. Um, there's you know there's a lot of people that they have those issues in the families and they get taken unfair advantage of. Well, and it would be it, it's hard to put somebody. There's no law that says we can put somebody permanently in one of those, mm -hmm. but you can review it, and the probate judge would be able to be reviewing it and reviewing it, and uh, decide whether we keep them in there. Yeah, and I, I think we would find that that would happen quite a bit. It's a, it's a battle, as you well know, um, over individual rights. Mm -hmm. And so at what points does one person's rights interfere with another person's rights? And uh, so then, you know, you're, you're reduced down to what the law says and those types of things. So it's a, uh, especially law enforcement has a uh, tricky job of, of that delicate balance there. Yeah, well, the laws we have are good. It's just the facilities. You know, we could work with it if we had more facilities. Yeah, I think it would be it would be good. Well, mm -hmm. we're going to take a break. Okay. When we get back, we'll talk about some other good stuff. And uh, stay with us here <laughs> on Meet the Newsmakers. Come out and check out the Alabama Tractor Difference. We can take care of all your needs of parts, sales, and service for RTVs, zero turns, and tractors and construction equipment. See us here in Lincoln at 620 Speedway Industrial Drive. Or come visit us here in Asheville at 275 6th Avenue or give us a call at 205-594-7000. At Bentley Prosthetic and Medical Supply, we care about you. We offer custom prosthetics, orthotics, diabetic shoes, and durable medical supplies. We're located here in Alexandria, Alabama, where it's a country feel but professional care. Come see us today. Hello, my name is Bob Couch, and I'm the owner of Couch's Jewelers. We are your destination for engagement rings, wedding bands, and anniversary and birthday gifts. We offer a wide selection of the best value diamond jewelry and engagement rings. We even gift wrap every purchase for free. And if you have some jewelry that is broken, no worries. Expert jewelry service is offered in-house. At Couches Jewelers, our customer service is unmatched. If you'd like a special jewelry item created just for you, please come to see us. Discover why Hungry Hut Barbecue has been Etowah County's go-to for mouth-watering barbecue for 40 years. If you're not in the mood for barbecue, try our very popular chicken finger plate with fried green tomatoes of our famous fried pickles. And don't forget about our drive through Come down to Hungry Hut's Barbecue today. At Southern States Bank, we pride ourselves on being your bank. We're your neighbors and involved in the community. We're the bank featuring the Southern Rewards Checking Account, a cashback account with no ATM fees. We are on the cutting edge and always have a smiling face to help you out. So, come to Southern States Bank, where we are committed to great service and being a great neighbor. 
Let us be the bank for you and your business. At Martin's Pharmacy, a family-owned business, shopping local means personalized care from a team you trust. We accept most insurance and Medicaid, offer $3 local delivery, and provide essential services like vaccinations and wellness checks. No appointment needed. From over-the-counter items to unique gifts and greeting cards, we have it all. Serving the community since 1997, we're more than a pharmacy. We're your neighbors. Support local and experience the difference at Martin's Pharmacy. Welcome back to Meet the Newsmakers. I'm here with Senator Keith Kelly. Senator, you're, you're going down next week to work on the budget, right? That's correct, yeah. So budgets are interesting things. So if, if, if say, I had an agency mm -hmm. that had a state budget and I wanted more, Mm -hmm. How do I do that, and what, what are the consequences? Okay, well, what we do is uh, each agency makes their request. Um, the budget chairman and myself, uh, want. I just don't want an increase of X percent. You've got to tell me what you want that for. Mm -hmm. And uh, we compile the budget based on the numbers that we have, the income that we have. And we have to make a decision on who gets what in that, and it's... Uh, very tough decision because sometimes you're you're looking at maybe, for example, um, whether uh, disabled veterans get something versus a, a mental health situation. So it's not always cut and dried. And a lot of times when people want new legislation um, that's going to create an expense, then that means that some of that, that money's got to come from somebody else and nobody wants to give it up. It's not like a business where you can go out and sell more widgets, right? You pretty much, no. you know what you're going to collect mm -hmm. and uh, there's only a few ways to raise that revenue so you've got to balance what, it you, is. what you got. People don't want, uh, don't want uh, tax increases and we're for efficient government so it's a, it's a balance and you're not going to ever please everyone with it but um, there's certain times that some things may have more priority than others. Uh, economic development is a big thing because we give some tax incentives to get jobs and industry to our state. And we've been real effective with that uh, over the past few years, and so much so other states are copying what Alabama's doing. Oh, there you go. So uh, we've got to up our game now to stay competitive on recruiting those. And that brings in more revenue. It does. So what is the thing that they're copying? What, what are we doing right? A lot of it is our tax incentives where they come in and they want to hit certain number of jobs. The other thing is some of the infrastructure that we put in from the state side. A lot of other uh, states are putting that more on the private sector, but what we found is when you give those tax credits, you get it back because of the revenue that's created off that far outweighs those credits that you're giving. It's long-term thinking. Long-term. That's good. That's important. Long-term, yep. And in a lot of those places, uh, you increase property values around where those are, are coming, and it also brings some, some pretty outstanding people to the state from other areas at times. Um, so what seems to be the industry that's most coming to Alabama? A lot. We've got a, a quite a few manufacturing type jobs that have come. Okay. Uh, our biggest challenge right now is workforce, though something that prior to COVID I wouldn't have thought we would have had any issue with. Hmm. In Alabama, we have a tremendous amount of people that are available to work, but are just choosing not to work. That's an interesting number. You know, a lot of people look at the unemployment rate. Of course, unemployment rate measures those people who want to work that are not employed, mm -hmm. and it's like what three percent state nationwide. That's right. right? the rate of people that could work but don't want to work is about 35 percent nationwide. It's and nobody talks about that number and where it has gone. And I think that number over the past 50 years has become bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I totally agree uh, with you. That has increased. Uh, one of the things that we experienced during COVID, um, we had a withdrawal of a lot of people that were retirement age that had retired. So they wanted a second job. It wasn't necessarily in their field of education or whatever. They just wanted something to do. What it did is, though, it provided uh, jobs for those, but it also provided a type of mentorship for younger workers to come on to, to have an example on someone that shows up for work on time, which is a big problem, mm -hmm. that knows how to communicate, 
and works without having to be told, can make decisions on their own. And uh, so when COVID come, we lost a huge number of those folks. And um, what has happened with that is they found other, ish other things to get involved in and we didn't have as many of them come back into the workforce. And so we're really struggling from, that's just one element of a number of different ones. Well, and training in the skilled trades is something everybody's working on. Right. Um, and I know I worked on a, a committee at the state level a few years ago about categorizing the labor force and training requirements and all that stuff. It, it was a long time ago. Yeah, um, we've got uh, we've got a number of different bills that we've done the last few years for training mm -hmm. uh, to help get some of that earlier uh, in people that are not looking at necessarily going to college but want to go into a trade. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, they make very good money. So getting them exposed to those at an earlier age, maybe in junior high, instead of waiting to their junior or senior year. Yeah, that's a good plan, you know, getting people interested in junior high. And then, you know, we've got the career tech schools at the high school level. Mm -hmm. um, but it, always, it, it was always curious to me, if you wanted to be a hairstylist or a makeup artist or a, or a welder or a plumber, you could get exposure to that in high school. Mm -hmm. um, but you couldn't get your certificate. You would have to go, you'd have to go to the, the tech colleges, the AA schools, to get your certificate. And, and I, that's good for the AA schools. Right? Well, we, we've actually put a piece in and some legislation to help with that. It exposes, uh, in a number of different professions, it exposes the people to them, the young kids to them earlier. So they can come in, uh, they can work in some of those programs, and actually when they get out of high school, they can take their test and they can be a full-fledged licensee in a number of different vocations and actually start out being a very good provider um, for their families, a taxpayer, and just a good citizen making, making good money right directly out of high school. And it's because of some of those things we put in and some journeyman programs in some of the employers that's helped with that. That's outstanding. I knew you would fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, you know, business, jobs, skilled trades, getting people into the skilled trades, employment. Some of this goes back to, to your visit to the border, mm -hmm. doesn't it? And, it does. and you were one of a select group of people, along with the sheriff and some others, mm -hmm. um, that went down to Texas a couple of weeks ago, right? A month mm -hmm. ago, maybe. Yeah, not very long ago. So. Give us a little primer in all of that, if you would. Well, um, you're not seeing it on the national news. Um, it is horrifying what I witnessed. Uh, the Border Patrol agents, are, hands are tied. Uh, you've got the cartels are pretty well in charge of the, the people coming in and the, uh, the border lines there. Uh, you have a lot of people that are coming that have to pay the cartels, depending on where they're coming from, six to ten thousand dollars. But you know, just like the American way, if they don't have the money, they can come on credit. <laughs> and um, so, what that basically does is, when they come in and they become legal, then they are in servitude to those for a large degree. But you're having a lot of women, especially children, that are dying crossing that border. We've got some that are coming that are illegal and they're coming to checkpoints. And in those checkpoints, you know, they're illegal. But the, the current administration is allowing them in, could be changed with a stroke of a pen, but they're allowing them in. And whatever name they're given there, uh, whatever they choose to give us is what we're taking. And uh, so you have that, that element coming in and you know absolutely nothing about them. And then you have the other element that has some type of record or trying to come through uh, avoiding the checkpoints. Um, you have a lot of the women that are being raped. There's, there's, um, if they can't keep up, they're being left behind, women and children. And it, is, it will break your heart from a humanitarian standpoint uh, just a human decency standpoint, but it also makes you angry as, as people are being allowed to come in and, and our border patrol's hands are tied. Right, and, and when they come in illegally, they're, they're given a name and then they're put on probation mm -hmm. um, and they got a court date two or three years down the road and, and like those guys that were arrested, I think, in Arizona 
for plotting a election day attack, they mm -hmm. were in the country illegally but on That's probation. Right. Yeah, there's a number of different programs. There's about seven agencies that deal with immigration. Um, so one of the biggest issues we've right, got right now of those that are coming in legally, which incidentally, there's about 180 different visas and permits and things like that where you can come in legally. Um, but you have to have a sponsor, and that sponsor is uh, supposed to help them acclimate while they're here. But we're not seeing a lot of that happen. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You were down in Sylacauga dealing with an issue uh, mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. Right. And uh, tell us quickly that what that was about. We had about three minutes to discuss all of that. Okay. <laughs> well, basically, you have uh, have some that have uh, from uh, Haiti that are there on humanit on a humanitarian parole, which parole is not our traditional sense of parole. It's the name of the program. But it was designed, that, that whole program was designed for someone such as they had medical needs and things like that to come into the country. And uh, that was going to take a while to get better. So it could last up to two years. But that, that program has been manipulated. And uh, those there that we've encountered are there legally. But there's a language barrier. Um, and then, of course, if they're in the country, then you've got to educate them by our Constitution. Uh, down there, we've only had one to come into the school system, mm -hmm. but we do have that, that obligation there. But it was a lack of information, and the uh, Department of Homeland Security is not letting us know who the sponsors are because they're supposed to be local, close by, to help them in the transition. So there's a lot of confusion, and then social media went, went crazy on it, so there's a lot of faults and rumors out there. Well, you, you, you said something off camera about warning us that, you know, this could happen here in Calvin yep. County. Is Absolutely. It, how, do we, how do we know when that happens? You when won't. It'll just happen. It'll just happen. A bus arrives? Uh, well, yeah. and a lot of times it's just a van. You'll, yeah. You won't know it. Wow. Well, um, it's, uh, I spent two days trying to trace down what someone had put on social media about uh, two buses come to find out it was just a high school football team that was passing through. So you, you have a lot of th those types of things. A lot of misinformation, a lot of fear, anger, yep. anxiety. And election day is coming up. Yep. Um, I always, you know, I've worked several elections, always felt Alabama had a really good system. Do you agree? I do. Um, we put uh, a number of laws into place to protect our, our elections, to protect our voting machines where they're not connected to the Internet. So I feel pretty confident in our ability uh, to, for good and secure elections. Well, this is a scary election year. Senator, <laughs> thank you for being with us. Thank and, you, John. Uh, I appreciate it. And have a good time in Montgomery next week. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you for being with us this week on Meet the Newsmakers. Hello, my name is Bob Couch, and I'm the owner of Couch's Jewelers. We are your destination for engagement rings, wedding bands, and anniversary and birthday gifts. We offer a wide selection of the best value diamond jewelry and engagement rings. We even gift wrap every purchase for free. And if you have some jewelry that is broken, no worries. Expert jewelry service is offered in-house. At Couch's Jewelers, our customer service is unmatched. If you'd like a special jewelry item created just for you, please come to see us. Discover why Hungry Hut Barbecue has been Etowah County's go-to for mouth-watering barbecue for 40 years. If you're not in the mood for barbecue, try our very popular chicken finger plate with fried green tomatoes of our famous fried pickles. And don't forget about our drive through Come down to Hungry Hut's Barbecue today. At Southern States Bank, we pride ourselves on being your bank. We're your neighbors and involved in the community. We're the bank featuring the Southern Rewards Checking Account, a cashback account with no ATM fees. We are on the cutting edge and always have a smiling face to help you out. So, come to Southern States Bank, where we are committed to great service and being a great neighbor. Let us be the bank for you and your business. At Martin's Pharmacy, a family-owned business, shopping local means personalized care from a team you trust. We accept most insurance and Medicaid, 
offer $3 local delivery, and provide essential services like vaccinations and wellness checks. No appointment needed. From over-the-counter items to unique gifts and greeting cards, we have it all. Serving the community since 1997, we're more than a pharmacy. We're your neighbors. Support local and experience the difference at Martin's Pharmacy.